Welcome to mini lesson 9. Today we're going to talk about the classification of particles as either fermions or bosons and what that means for whether they obey a Pauli exclusion principle or not. So this should be review from your modern physics class uh, or possibly a chemistry class. You can find some discussion of this in Appendix A of Schroeder. You can go back to your modern physics text of course. Uh, and then there's this link to this uh, Sigma Pi Sigma article it could be interesting to look at. It's pretty well written and it's at the level of PY413 so it might be a good review tool for for uh, getting ready for the test that's coming up in two weeks. So I want us to regard it at first essentially as an observational fact that particles in the universe can be categorized according to what spin they have as either fermions or bosons. So if you have a particle that either has spin one half or is composed of an odd number of spin one half particles, that's called a fermion, and it obeys the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that no two fermions can have the same set of quantum numbers. And so this is a fact that helps us explain the shell structure of atoms, so in other words, the periodic table of the elements, as well as some other facts about metals that we'll talk about in a few days. So the idea that if we have E sub S in the notation that we use in statistical mechanics to describe an energy level with a set of quantum numbers S, let's say, we can only place one fermion in that level. Of course, we could place none. We'll say that in a minute, but either one or none. And so sometimes, like in your chemistry class, you'll draw levels as being occupied by a spin up and a spin down fermion, and that's fine. But what it really is is a shorthand notation for two levels labeled by distinct uh, spin projections on the z-axis, m sub s equals plus or minus a half. All right, so this is really just a shorthand, and the real Pauli exclusion principle says you may only put one per distinct set of quantum numbers. <clears throat> so by contrast, bosons are particles that either have integer spin or are composed of an even number of spin one-half fermions, right? So that if you have an even number of spin one-halves, the net spin will come out to be an integer. And there is no exclusion principle for bosons. So you can put as many particles in an energy level as you want. You can put one, you can put four, you can put 10 to the 23rd, which is a really interesting possibility that we're going to keep talking about as we go on. Um, and in some ways, this makes bosons a little bit harder to work with than fermions because there's such a restrictive way of occupying fermionic le or energy levels with fermions. It's a little bit easier to deal with them in some circumstances, whereas bosons, you have a lot more possibilities. So let's look at some examples within the standard model. All the matter particles are fermions. So all the leptons, electrons, muons, and taus, all the quarks, there's too many to list all the neutrinos, again one neutrino for each of the leptons, those are all spin one-half fermions. Within the standard model, force carriers are all bosons, so photons mediate electromagnetic force, gluon strong force, the massive vector bosons a weak force, uh, and then the Higgs causes a symmetry breaking that gives the massive vector bosons their mass, so those are all bosons. In composite particles, protons and neutrons are each made up of three quarks, so that makes them fermions. Helium-3 is a fermion, whereas helium-4 is a boson. Rubidium-87 is a really famous boson. That was the uh, element in which Bose-Einstein condensation was first demonstrated, so it was a strict requirement that there would be, that these atoms had to be bosonic for that to happen. Uh, Professor Thomas's lab at NC State is famous for um, studying gases made of lithium-6. So lithium-6 has three protons, three neutrons, and three electrons, and that makes nine total fermions, so the atom itself is fermionic. And so John Thomas's lab studies cold fermionic gases in highly controlled environments. 
So by contrast, lithium-7 has one extra particle that gives it, it, gives it an even count of fermions, so the atom taken as a whole is a boson. And another famous example of a boson is a pion. So that's a quark-antiquark pair. Um, again, that makes it a boson. Uh, if you think back, maybe in modern physics, you learned that in early theories of the strong nuclear force, it was imagined that uh, pion exchange was the mediator of the strong nuclear force. <clears throat> and so maybe it's not too surprising that something that was once thought to be the force carrier you know, ended up being a boson. Let's take a quick look at this example of helium-3 versus helium-4, which is really cool. So helium-4 helium is, the, is the normal isotope of helium, so two protons, two neutrons. Um, Yeah, that's right. I don't know what I'm thinking. Yeah, helium four, two protons, two neutrons, uh, in the in the nucleus. And um, if you cool it down, when you get to about two Kelvin, you find that suddenly the liquid can flow without any viscosity, without any friction. Uh, it can flow through capillaries. It can sort of run up the walls. There's a lot of really cool videos of this if you search. <coughs> um, and so by contrast, helium-3, which is a fermion, um, does not have such a transition at 2 Kelvin. As you cool it down, it becomes a liquid at about the same temperature that, that uh, helium-4 does, but you just keep cooling it and cooling it and cooling it, and it's just boring, right? Uh, until you get to about a millikelvin, and then it does indeed have a superfluid phase. And so this is... Uh, a manifestation of the boson versus fermion character of the two atoms, right? Helium-4 is a boson already, and so it readily becomes a superfluid because all the atoms can sort of condense into one energy level and they can sort of start to move as one wave function. Helium-3, by contrast, is a fermion and it can't sort of condense into one energy level. The only way it could ever do that is if it got cold enough that helium-3 atoms could sort of pair up and act like a composite two-part, two-fermion system that could actually have a condensation as though it were a boson. So it's a pretty cool... Uh, so this was the Nobel Prize, I think, helium-3 superfluidity was a Nobel Prize, I think, in 1996. I had just started college around that time, and one of my professors knew one of the people who, who won the Nobel Prize, <clears throat> Professor Osherhoff from Stanford. That was not my professor, that was the guy who won the Nobel Prize. Um, Osherhoff's talks and lectures about his discovery are really interesting and are kind of an, an interesting window into what the world of experimental condensed matter physics can be like. Um, so take a look if you're interested in that kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so this is actually really, as I said, we should take it most importantly as an observational fact that there are bosons and fermions. Um, and you actually can prove this, but it's very, very difficult. And we're not going to do it here. We can't possibly do it here. But we can sort of make some plausibility arguments for why there are only two categories of particles. So the plausibility argument is that if we have a two-particle wave function, psi of x1, x2, where x1 labels the coordinates of the two particles, um, we could swap the particles, just swap the arguments to say in the, in the wave function. And since the particles are indistinguishable, we would expect nothing observable to change after the swap. And so it's important that you can't observe the wave function by itself. Um, you can observe things that are determined by the wave function. You know, you can do experimental tests of quantum mechanics, but you never sit down and measure psi. What you can measure, though, is psi squared. And so what we know is that psi squared before the swap has to be psi squared after the swap. And the end result, if you square root both sides, is that swapping the particle can basically pick up a plus or a minus in front of the wave function. So 
There are two possibilities for what happens when you swap particles. You can either not change at all, that would be the plus sign, or you can pick up a minus sign. And that's basically sort of the plausi plausibility origin about why there are two types of particles in the universe. <clears throat> so multi-particle wave functions break into two classes. If you have the positive sign, you're symmetric under particle exchange, and that means you're a boson. If you pick up the negative sign, that means you're anti-symmetric under particle exchange and you're a fermion. So we haven't talked about spin in this analysis at all. This is not a proof really of anything. Again, it's like a it's a it's a plausibility argument and, and not even a particularly great one at that. Um, but it does give us an idea of why within quantum mechanics there are only two types of particles. So if we want to bring spin in and say, why does the anti-symmetric case correspond to spin one half? We really have to merge special relativity and quantum mechanics in quantum field theory. And so there is something in quantum field theory called the spin statistics theorem that is, I think it's essentially considered a rigorous proof. I mean, I think there are people who would dispute that anything in quantum field theory is rigorous, but I'm not qualified to comment on that. So quantum field theory, where you've basically properly merged quantum mechanics and special relativity, tells you that indeed the particles with integer spin are the symmetric case uh, with respect to exchange and half integer spin are anti-symmetric. <clears throat> so again, check this article from Sigma Pi Sigma. Here I have a quote from it. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this, is, this is from the article which actually quotes Feynman. And so evidently Feynman said that we don't really understand the spin statistics theorem in a level that can be explained in like a modern physics class or say an undergraduate thermal physics class. And he notes that this probably means we don't have a complete understanding of the fundamental principle involved, which is interesting, right? It means, it means that we all have some work to do. So let's take a final look at where we're going with this in the next lectures. So we just want to think about a level E sub S and we're going to occupy this level with fermions. And what I just want to do is enumerate all of the possibilities of N sub S and E sub S that could be in this level. So you could have no particles in the level and therefore no energy, right? I mean, that's doesn't count. Or you could have one particle in the level and let's call it epsilon worth of energy. All right, so there is very limited possibilities for a fermionic level, and this is going to allow us to calculate the grand partition function in the next mini lecture. For a bosonic level, same thing, except now we can have from one up to n particles, and then from epsilon up to n epsilon uh, as the energy where n can be macroscopically large. And in fact, when we do the calculation of the grand partition function, we're going to let it go to infinity. And so in the next two mini lectures, we're going to do the quantum statistical mechanics using the grand canonical partition function for bosons and fermions. So we'll see you next time. <clears throat>